we need to solve this problem on a timeline that is, or we need to move forward in solving this problem on a timeline that fusion is not at. So the, the, you know, I would love for that to be the case, but we have a giant fusion reactor that is available to us right now to help us solve this problem. And I think we are making a lot more use of it, the sun, for those of you that didn't get the reference. Um, and it's so it, it, it's, 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 it's a safe distance away. Um, but I do think the one that you highlighted um, that I will pick up on is AI. And I think the way we can use AI to solve a lot of the problems, we talked about it in one of the other lectures about integrating renewable power into our systems, adapting our household loads, dealing with our EV charging uh, cycles and how we make use of the fact that not only will we have these electric vehicles on our grid, but we essentially we have you know, the distributed energy system of having all of those batteries all over the place. Where do they charge? Where do they discharge? How do we use them, et cetera? How do we put them into houses? How do we manage household loads? I think those are gonna be small from a technical perspective, they're not hard. But when you think of the conversations that we're at right now and where our systems are at, I think small leaps can make a huge difference, opening up uh, consumers into being more active participants in electricity markets, et cetera. All of that stuff is super exciting. And it's, you know, a year away, not 40, 50, 60, whatever the years is away. I, I just add to that, Andrew, that uh, this is one of the biggest debates in climate circles now about whether one should be a techno optimist or pessimist. And my view is that, um, from a scientific perspective, Frank Wilczek, who's a Nobel Prize winning physicist, wrote that uh, every, there's, as Andrew said, there's only, we talk in terms of energy sources all the time. There's only one energy source, the sun, and everything else is an energy carrier or storage mechanism, whether it's oil and gas or um, a full photovoltaic cell or mm -hmm. a pipeline. It's just a way of carrying energy that's been created by the sun. Um, and Frank, I'd never known this data, but I always take comfort in scientific data, that every day the planet is washed in enough solar energy uh, to satisfy 10,000 times the energy we use in a year. Mm -hmm. And when you look back on all of the miraculous and marvelous scientific advancements of the past 100 years, I just refuse to believe we're not going to figure out a better way to capture, transmit, and use that energy than what we found in um, dinosaurs, right? <laughs> I just, I, I, that's what makes me ultimately an optimist. But well, and we have gotten a lot better. At we it, have right? gotten a lot better at it. That, you look at yeah. and how much cheaper it's become. You talk about this eloquently in the book. I really believe that. But the the counter is, and this is what I were. I've become much more optimistic long term about climate change, and much more pessimistic short term because there's a stock and flow problem here, right? There's about 2 trillion tons of little more uh, than 2 trillion tons of carbon in the atmosphere that shouldn't be there. It used to be in safe places like under uh, the ground and we've taken it from there, released it into the atmosphere and counted on the oceans to absorb it. So it used to be in a safe place, we put it in an unsafe place. And the timeline is, is really astonishing. Uh, two thirds, uh, sorry, three quarters of that carbon has been put in the atmosphere since the negotiation of the Kyoto, Kyoto Accord. I like that in your email. You that know, it's, good, uh, it's stunning, pitch. right? 25 years. We, in the last, we think about this as, oh man, this has been a problem since the Industrial Revolution. Since we started becoming aware of the problem, we've made it three times as bad, <laughs> right? And the most pernicious uh, um, attribute of climate change causing emissions is that they persist for hundreds of years. So we've already baked enough into the atmosphere, and I use that uh, verb aptly, I think, uh, to cause problems that we have no institutional capacity to deal with over the next 30, 40 years. So as the parent of two teenagers, this is what I worry about. I think that what's coming is gonna come faster and gonna be harder to deal with than we have any capacity to absorb human migration. Uh, Andrew talked about the, the one that worries me most, but also this climate change is going to present itself as a water problem, first and foremost, people. There is going to be too much of it in some places, too little of it in others, and in some really unlucky places, too much and too little in sequence. Um, so, you know, I don't know where I'm going with this other than to say, yeah. I believe in science's ability. To, you should be optimistic it, it, about science in the long-term horizon, but in the short term, 
as you say about fusion, yeah, it's just not there to solve the problem. We it's have. the it's the getting yeah, getting stuff out of the atmosphere, not stopping us from putting it more in. 